So, uh, hi, uh, my name is Jack Airy. I'm a research fellow at Policy Exchange. I do a lot of our work in housing, and today we're joined by an excellent panel. Uh, so, starting on my far left, we have Dawn Foster, who is an economist at The Guardian, writes regularly on housing. And we have Helen Hayes, uh, who is MP for Dulwich and West Norwood, member of the Housing Committee's uh, and Local Government Select Committee, and formerly a town planner. Indeed. So, okay, lots of interesting comments there. Uh, then on my left, we have Sarah Jones, MP, who is Shadow Housing Minister, MP for Croydon Central, and also, I believe, used to run shelters campaigns. So, I did. Uh, and then, sorry, and so Robin Wells, on my right, who was Mayor of Newham from 2002 to 2018, and then before that, the council leader from 1995 to 2002. So we have an excellent panel. Uh, so today, I'm just going to do uh, quick opening remarks, then we'll head to the speakers, then we'll do an audience Q&A. I should say, um, Sarah needs to leave at 25 past. 20 past, so we're going to let Sarah go first. We're going to ask very briefly go to the audience for one or two very, very precise questions, um, and then we'll let Sarah leave if that's okay. Uh, and then after that, we'll go around the speakers again and we'll do an audience QA. And so, um, today we're talking about uh, beautiful buildings, uh, design and style. So, um, the Labour movement has had a long history of emphasizing the importance of design and style. In the words of Nye Bevan, then the post war housing minister, to then the Prime Minister Clement Attlee, we should be judged for a year or two by the numbers of homes no, sorry, we should be judged by for a year or two by the number of homes we build. We should be judged in ten years by the type of houses we build. So further back, while they espouse quite different socialisms, both William Morris and Edward Bellamy were united by the importance of the aesthetic to the built environment and society as a whole. Further forward to the present day, uh, to quote the Shadow Chancellor, John McDonnell, people must like the environment they live in. We need to make it beautiful and enjoyable. So Labour has a rich tradition of caring about not just housing people and providing enough homes, but caring for the, the aesthetic quality of those homes too. Today what we want to ask, as the party looks to take power and build a new Jerusalem or to rebuild Britain, what role design and style has in Labour's, Labour's uh, housing policies? Uh, so as at Policy Exchange, this is a key theme of our research. Uh, our report published in June, Building More, Building Beautiful, uh, these and I think we've got a few copies at the back, uh, it made the case that if new homes are built in um, ways that people like, they're much more likely to um, give consent for those homes to be built in their area. So we argue in the report that much of the house building industry and house building process has lost sight of this ideal, with many new homes being built in designs and styles that people and communities just don't like. The role of the architects has been relegated to um, that of serving the demands of the developer. The role of the planner has been um, diminished to accepting buildings that people don't like because to reject them would mean rejecting investment in the area. And the thoughts, hopes, wishes and demands of the people that live in those homes and those of the wider community going, go ignored. So it's in this context that this afternoon we'd like to discuss whether nimbyism can be overcome by building beautiful buildings. So this is today's essay question. With that, I'd like to hand over to Sarah to provide her initial thoughts. Thank you. Do you mind if I stand up? Please. Some, I've only been an MP for a year, and there's something that happens to you when you become an MP that you have to stand up when you speak, um, because you spend all your time bobbing up and down, and if you're actually given the floor, you just have to stand up, so forgive me. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm the Shadow Housing Minister. I'm quite new to the brief, but I, um, as... You mentioned I used to run campaigns at Shelter. I was also on the board of a housing association for five years, and I also work with British Land. So I've worked with developers and charities and housing associations in this sector and am very passionate um, about it. I think before we answer the essay question, you know, we, we need to understand the wider context in which we are operating, which is a catastrophic housing crisis. Uh, we have, as we know, less homes still being built, even though the numbers are going up, there's less being built than there were at the time of the crash. We know that uh, their homelessness has doubled. We know that increasing numbers of people are living in a very poor quality private rented sector. You have increasing numbers of people who are not uh, in conditions that we would consider to be adequate. We have a million uh, young people under the age of 35, a million more young Young people who are unable to own their own home. We have high costs of renting in some areas and across, across the country there are housing crises of different flavours and different colours. So in some places it's about quality, in some places it's about 
quantity and supply, and those are big issues. And uh, you know, today we have had our housing debate, and John Healy has announced uh, 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 some new policies that will make quite a radical difference uh, if Labour comes to power in the next election. And I would encourage you all to look at them. I'm not going to go through them all now, but I'm going to talk a bit about NIMBYism. Um, I just want to ask um, people in the room. Um, how much of the Lake District is covered with lakes out of interest, do you think, as a percentage? Three. You know the answer, it's three. <laughs> right. So what percentage of the UK is peat bog? 9.4%. They're very clever people in this, in this room know pretty much exactly um, the, the figures. I find that extraordinary. 9.4% of, of the UK is peat bog. Um, the, the amount of land that is built on already in this country is tiny. Uh, in the southeast, it's less than 4% of land is built on, and that doesn't mean housing, that means roads, that means any kind of infrastructure at all. So there are lots of misconceptions, I think, when people think about housing, that they think everything's being concreted over when actually the reality is it isn't. Um, there are reasons to be cheerful in terms of people's views of housing and whether we should be building more housing and the NIMBY issue. Um, the public are more inclined to believe we should be building more homes than they were, but importantly, they are more inclined to believe we should be building more homes in their area. And that's really important because that's always the argument, is how do you overcome that kind of NIMBY uh, where you, you say you want more homes but you don't want them in your, in your local area. Um, I think when it comes to building beautiful homes, we have to be very ambitious and think in terms of the long term. 85% um, 85 of the homes that we currently have will still be here in 2050. You know, these are, these, are, these, are, these are things that we build for a long time and we need to think long term in terms of our planning. And what Labour wants to do, apart from build 100,000 affordable homes a year, end homelessness in the next Parliament and uh, legislate to define what affordable is linked to earnings as well as to house prices and uh, to put a new levy on people with a second home who rent their home out uh, as a holiday let uh, to pay to cut the numbers of people that we are uh, seeing who are homeless and as well as uh, us enabling local councils to build and massively increasing the amount of grant that we're going to put into uh, the economy to build more homes and to make sure we have the types of homes that we need. We also care very much about design and uh, this is um, a green paper that we brought out before the government brought out their green paper on um, housing for the many it's called. If you put it into Google uh, you'll see it and people should um, do have a look because it's, it's full of um, many different policies in many different areas looking at land value, looking at CPOs, looking at how we can learn lessons from Germany and others and it really is a credible very comprehensive um, uh, brief, but we talk about introducing an exemplar design guide. This is in the section on safe, secure and decent homes, alongside the next affordable homes funding prospectus to encourage first class design. We'll consider a funding uplift for bids that use local materials and we want to appoint a chief architect for affordable housing. We want to prioritise, uh, you know, obviously all of the good quality housing in terms of, you know, zero carbon as you would expect. Um, and we also want to look at all of the kind of smart tech issues as well and, and incentivise those. But design is absolutely key. Um, I won't carry on because I've probably talked too much, but uh, just to make a point about um, NIMBYs to end with, uh, we had a meeting with Alex Morton, who was the um, Conservative uh, advisor in number 10 uh, for several years, and uh, he talked about how he's tried to overcome um, some of the... Um, uh, some of the kind of NIMBY not in my backyard, and there is an issue about making sure these beautiful homes that we build go to people who live locally and I think that is a way of winning an argument so not only should we have beautiful design not be able to tell the tenure difference between whether something's council housing or housing association or private not have poor doors all of those kind of things we need to get rid of but we also need to make sure that when we build homes we say people in that hyper local area they're the ones that will benefit because then people have a very different view because they understand that they will get the benefit in their community of that new housing so I'll leave it there but it's a pleasure to be here thank you for inviting me and I'm very happy to take some questions thank you Sarah. <laughs> okay.
two very precise questions, please, and they must have a question mark on the end. So you say on the front, and then. Excuse me, can I ask, is the constant flashing essential? Because it makes me feel quite unwell. There's endless flashing going on. I, I think it's caused by photography. Um, okay, we'll if try. We'll try. Essential, right. then thank, fine. thank you. We'll, 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 stop. We'll, we'll try. We'll try. We'll try and limit yeah. it. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, person at the front here, and then um, there's a gentleman at the back in glasses with his hand up there. <coughs> so. Hi there. Uh, just to ask about affordability and the regulations around it, which many developers seem to uh, evade very successfully. In other words, when they build developments that should have a set number of affordable dwellings, they usually find a way of getting around it. And there are even agencies out there which uh, help developers evade those responsibilities. So what might you be able to do about that? Okay. So a question on viability and then the general... Affordability and, um, and then there's a gentleman in the glasses over there. That's my question now. Yes, please. Uh, you said that there's such a small percentage of uh, land built on in the UK. I'm just wondering, does that percentage take into account uh, land that's just not possible to build on, like rocky stuff and that type of thing? Just wondering how that percentage, what how that percentage is taken into account different types of land. Yeah. Okay. So, Sarah, if you uh, respond, then we'll go from left to right to then go back to speech, as that's right. So then we we'll go. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, um, so affordability absolutely is a, is a huge issue and there will be a presumption of affordable development um, uh, under a, a Labour government and our target is to build affordable homes but to redefine them as, as truly affordable, um, so linked to, to earnings and to um, house prices. Um, you, you know, there, are, there will be grant funding available for those purely for affordable housing, so the four billion a year that we were spending in the last year of the Labour government we're going to introduce back again and the government at the moment um, only spends, uh, I think last year spent about half a billion on, on affordable housing grants. So, uh, and there will be all kinds of conditions attached to that. Um, but there will be an expectation of, 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 of building ho affordable homes as part of local area plans. So obviously at the moment you have to have a local plan. That's what you're supposed to have. And under the new MPPF there will be more incentives for that. But 50% of councils don't even have a local plan. So they're not even at the point of saying, well, this is the amount of affordable housing we need. So it's very easy for developers, as you know, to, to build whatever they want to build because there isn't a structure within which they can um, the council can push back and argue their case. Uh, so so um, plans will be very important as, as part of a Labour um, government. But, you know, there are all kinds of things we can do to increase affordability, not least stop the hemorrhaging of affordable housing that we have at the moment. 50,000 homes a year we lose... Uh, through right to buy and through reclassification, just just that just falls out of the ether, and we don't have we don't have any more as, as public good. Um, and um, there is, you know, there's a whole argument about making house, uh, housing infrastructure. You know, it's something that the state funds so that we can borrow on the back of that and build more housing. And it's a completely fundamental. The, the labour approach is a completely fundamentally different approach to uh, to housing. On the um, Question of how that figure was come, I don't know. Uh, the, uh, the, the figure is, is something that I've read on uh, the BBC Facts um, page, and it's just interesting as an example of um, people's perceptions about what we build on and what we don't build on. I was also in a fringe meeting yesterday where it transpired that uh, there, are mo there is more land given over to golf courses in Surrey than there is to housing, mm. and uh, that there is you know extraordinary number of golf courses which is not very environmentally friendly and not very... Uh, not very good for anybody apart from golf players um, and uh, you know there, there are all kinds of things where you can point to the fact that actually you know we're not as dense as we think we are although in Croydon 50, 50 where I am 57% of land is, is developed so even though that's smaller than you might think you know you still have to absolutely pay attention to what local people say because they care about their green spaces and they don't want them to be built on so we've got to respect that as well. Great so if Dawn if you give your introductory remarks, then we'll go to Helen, and then we'll go to Sir Robin. Thank you. Um, I'll thank Sarah, first of all, for, uh, for telling me that I'm still young under the age of 35, so thank you. you <laughs> um, so I've written about housing for about kind of six years now, um, and I think at first it was quite interesting because most people talked about housing purely in terms of home ownership, and then when people began to struggle to you know, 
own their own homes, it became more of an issue. Um, and one of the things about writing about social housing is that you get to wander around a lot of new developments and uh, other other sorts of things. There's one very, very similar to the one on the front of the Policy, policy Exchange book that I went to with Prince Charles. Um, it's just behind Angel Station. It's tenure blind. Um, there are some council uh, and social housing units in there, but they look identical to the Georgian over 100 years um, properties directly opposite. There's a, big park, there's a big kind of park in the middle of it, and it's pretty much impossible to tell the tenure of the people in there. And so... If a family moves in, you've got no idea if they bought it or if they rent it from the council, and that's been a really fascinating way to make sure that the community works there. Um, but I completely echo Sarah's point that I think the best way to do this is, A, you know, design is very important, but equally trying to get people involved in local plans and pointing out the fact that if we build homes that are good, that will last a long time, it benefits the local community massively. Uh, where I live in southwest London, um, I live in a former local authority flat in a really, really brilliant uh, council development that was built in the 1930s. There's a lot of communal space in the middle of each block. All the blocks are linked together. It's quite quiet. All of the rooms are really, really big. And, you know, it's still about half, half council, half has been sold off through right to buy. Um, but what works about it is, A, the communal space. Uh, which means that a lot of people can just let their children play and see them from the from the windows. And the fact that the rooms are really, really big, uh, there's so much storage that we don't know what to do with it. And often when I look at the tiny properties that my friends have had their parents help them to buy, there's no storage, they're really, really tiny. It feels like they're made of cardboard. They can hear their neighbours sneeze, let alone what they get up to at night. Um, and so I think that... It, that you know, we need to look at how housing will fit into the community, what it will offer the community, who will be moving into it, um, but also looking at making sure that when people move into these properties, they aren't just seen as one small step on the ladder. So when I go and see my friends' tiny cardboard flats, you know that they don't want to spend very, very long there. They just want to buy a property, hopefully earn a bit more money, and move into a more expensive property. Whereas you know, uh, when I grew up in council housing, when people moved in there, um, or when people bought properties, they planned to stay there for the rest of their life pretty much. And it didn't matter if they had a spare room or you know they doubled up sometimes. They planned to stay there for a long time. They planned to stay there in the community for a long time. Whereas now we have a big problem with uh, a lot of private renters who are constantly moved out of their local area. Every few, every few years as rents are uh, hiked. And then we have a lot of kind of rabbit hutch flats that, that again are seen as a first step on the housing ladder. And they're seen as kind of quite temporary. Nobody expects to live there for a long time. You move into a one bed flat and as soon as you have kids, you have to move straight out. Um, so we need bigger places they, and, and we need to make sure that, you know, that they are available first of all for people in the local community and they have to be inhabited. So I'm very happy with Labour's announcement on second homes, uh, you know, um, on second homes movement in, in council tax. Um, where I live in South West London, if I stand on my balcony, I can see a huge number of uh, towers being built in Vauxhall and whenever I walk past them on a Saturday night, there are no lights on whatsoever and there are people sleeping in tents at the bottom of them and it's just sickening to just see people in you know in the middle of winter sleeping in a tent outside underneath about 200 empty properties that are literally just being used as asset lockers so I think we need to make sure that people live in there um, we need to give people more power to input into their local plans if you get people involved in local plans and say this is what will happen to the community you know, uh, what do you want us to do? Where do you want the housing? What kind of, you know, what kind of allocation system should we use? Then people will be a lot happier. If they just see things popping up, they complain about their views, etc. Whereas when they know more about who is moving in, what it will look like, and know that it's designed to be part of the community for, for the long term, they'll be a lot happier. Thank you. Good, thank you. I might stand up so that I can, I can see you as well as you being able to see me. Um, uh, so um, I thought it would be helpful to speak a little bit about what design is and how design works um, because it's, I think it's kind of, it's a complete, you know, there will be a consensus that everything should be well designed and um, 
you know, and, and then everybody has a good idea of what they don't like and what they do like, and you know. But actually, design is a process that leads to outcomes, and the policy framework that surrounds each bit of the process is quite important in determining what those outcomes are, and and has um, quite a um, the values that are at work in the policies that underpin those processes really matter for what you get in terms of outcomes. So the first thing to say is design happens in stages. So for any new development that takes place, there will be a framework, a sort of concept drawing, there will be a planning application, there will be really detailed design, and then there'll be the construction phase of development. And design can go wrong at any, at any one of those stages. It can be eroded at any one of those stages. At the moment, we have a planning policy um, system that incentivizes developers to spend a lot of money at the planning application stage and less so in the kind of detailed delivery stages because there's no accountability or very little accountability around what, what actually gets built. So resource it's selling your scheme to your local community, to your planning authority, to your planning committee, lots of uh, incentive to invest in that stage of the process. But by the time it gets to buildings actually being built on the ground, um, you know, you're much more assessed only in terms of whether they meet the minimum safety standards for the building rather than whether they followed through on the intent that was clear at the point at which everybody said democratically, we think this is a good design and it should go forward to, to, to be built. So I think that's the first problem with our, with our design process at the moment. Second thing to say is design is multifaceted. So it isn't only about what an individual building looks like. It's about the layout and the functionality of both the building but also the wider area. It's about the mix of uses. It's about the size, the appearance of the buildings. It's about the detail, the materials, the, the finishes, but also the performance of the buildings, whether they're thermally well insulated or not, things that you can't see. And then they're about the interiors as well. So when we think about you know, beautiful homes and what we'd like to live in, actually it's all of those things. It's about the neighbourhood that you're in as well as kind of what it's like sitting in your living room in your new home. So beautiful buildings fail if they're not surrounded by infrastructure that meets the needs of the, of, of the wider community. Um, design is value laden. You know, we can all, I think it's a really good question to ask yourself as you're walking around and looking at different buildings wherever you are. Think about what are the values that were at work in the design process that led to that particular building. Design can be inclusive and accessible. It can be outward focused and community oriented. It can be generous or it can be really mean. It can be inward looking and security conscious and turning its back on the wider world. Um, and it can echo the past or it can look to the future. And all of those are design, uh, are value based decisions that are at work in the di design process that help to um, inform the outcomes. And as labour people, we should be thinking about how do our labour values, about inclusivity, about um, justice, about equality, how do they feed into and inform design decisions that are being taken? Values matter more than big gestures or statements when it comes to, in my view, when it comes to whether a building is beautiful or not, whether it works in design terms, that's far more important. Um, the fourth thing to say is that design, designers work to a brief, and the brief is underpinned by policy. So a really good example of this is the practice that I used to work for um, when I was a town planner, um, designed and, and, and then saw through to completion a housing estate in East London that was built at a full 50% of genuinely affordable social housing. Why was that the case? Because the brief came from a planning policy framework that was set by a London mayor and a Labour government. Um, that exact same scheme could be built now and it absolutely would not be built with 50% genuinely affordable social housing. It would look the same, it would have the same amount of money spent on it and it would be for a different group of people because the planning policy framework has fundamentally changed to allow the commitment to affordable social housing, genuinely affordable social housing to be eroded um, through the planning system because of, of the emphasis that our current system places from this government on viability assessments. So there's a big question to ask about who's writing the brief for the designers and then you know, how is policy informing, informing that brief. And then final thing to say is that design is a process and it's a process that can involve um, small groups of people sitting in a room doing some drawings or it can involve everybody in a community. Um, and who is involved in that process also has an influence on the outcomes. But those processes really need resourcing. You can't do consultation and engagement on the cheap. And, and it's, no, it's also no good saying that's solely the remit of 
the developer and the applicant because they've got a particular agenda in that process that's about convincing the planning authority that everybody loves their scheme. Genuine engagement requires commitment and resourcing of local authorities to do that job properly and democratically on behalf of those communi their, their communities. And so, le uh, so, 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 I'm sorry, talking for too long, but um, just to, to, to conclude, I think all of those factors, what happens at which stage in the design process, who's writing the brief, what are the values that are at work and who is involved, I think are the key determinants of whether, um, firstly, whether communities will um, accept and support new housing being built in their area, and secondly, whether we get to something that all of us can consider to be beautiful or not. Thank you, Helen. Uh, yeah. okay, I'm just going to go to Sarah quickly before she has to leave. Yes, um, I just wanted to say how amazing Helen Hayes is. Um, she's, uh, <laughs> she knows so much. She's on the select committee and uh, is absolutely in Parliament, a voice of authority, and uh, she's just shown she, she's an um, absolute expert. So I just wanted to say that. I just wanted to um, uh, leave with one slightly obscure question, but uh, it's not a question. It's, it's what a housing... Uh, Chair of Housing was saying to me the other day, which is that... Um, they, uh, as a council, are struggling because they're asking developers to build more affordable homes and the, uh, what they're having to give up is the quality of the design. That they, The council planners are having to make a difficult decision where their political leaders, uh, Labour leaders, are saying to them, well, we need more affordable housing, so you're going to have to let the design give. And that's yeah. where we are at the moment. And the, the, the process that Helen just described about how this should work and how it could work, and I think the policies that Labour are putting forward in terms of the, the, the kind of macroeconomic funding of, you know, seeing housing as infrastructure and investing in it properly could make that difference. But at the moment, for local authorities, you know, making that choice between a bit of affordable or a bit better quality is completely hopeless and we're not going to find better design with that system. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, can we give Sarah a brief applause? Before you... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and on to Sir Robert. Right, I I I'll stand as well. C can you hear me at the back? <laughs> sorry then, I'm really sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's a bit, bit hard on you. Um, I wanted... Actually, a number of things that we said, I'll try and reflect on some of those as I'm going on, but what I want to talk, I want to really emphasize is on the issue of praxis and practicality. We can have as many policies as you like, but if they don't work to deliver the things you want, if you don't talk about how you do it on the ground, you'll end up with a set of policies that will not deliver for you the things that you want to deliver. Now, the other thing I want to just get out of the room, we're talking about design, beauty, and all the rest of it. We all know we're in the middle of a housing crisis, Yeah. Come on, yeah, come on, come on, it's hot, but come on, let's try, let's try and keep with it. I'm trying to stop you going to sleep, it's so hot. So we all know that I could do you 50% affordable tomorrow. This could take what? What do you think? Eight double bedrooms? Eight separate double bedrooms? Because that's what you do. You, you put density, you put bedroom size, you put design, you put cost, you put affordable, and you put them all together, and it's a really complicated question. It's easy. I don't believe people that are doing 50% affordable the, the tiny tiny places they're building and that that may work for some of the people who are moving in so long as they've got a way to go forward so you, it's a complex issue for 40 years in this country we've been creating a housing crisis yeah it's going to take a long time to fix it my own personal view is the answer is just go bloody build 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 when I was new, we set up what we thought was the first and biggest housing company, and we are going to borrow two billion. I don't understand the bit that says you can't borrow money, by the way, to build property. Even Bexley, Bexley Council has set up a housing company to build housing. Even Bexley. Now, if Bexley can do it, why can't all Labour authorities do it to start, start? So, I want to put that out there, and now talk about what we're supposed to talk about, okay? Because I think it is all complex, but if you give up the quality of the development and the quality of the design and the beauty, if you give that up, you will not only not do what Nye Bevan said, you'll be bulldozing them in 50 years. We're doing that in Canning Town. We knocked down something that was built in the 60s and 70s because nobody wanted to live in it. You come across places where nobody wants to live. Our policy was always very clear. Build for the community. The community was kind of our substitute for for design and quite a bit, but Bill, we had a design panel with, with architects and planners and, 
and designers on it. But the argument was always, I would rather sacrifice a few to create a place that people want to live. Because we have to plan for the future, and we have to have something that works. If you don't, you'll knock it down in 50 years and you've lost what you did. And you'll have lost the benefit. We need to plan for the future. As a movement, we should be talking about that and saying, we'll build for the future. I'm a great fan of authorities building, taking the rents, <coughs> the yeah, market rent, take the profit and reinvest it in housing. What's wrong with that? Why should the developers take all the money and not the public sector on the bit that's really, really profitable? Why should they get all the juicy bits? Let's have us have, have some of the money and put it back in. So if you look then at the sort of things that have happened, I can give you, you can look at the specific and detailed examples of where design works and, and where design... So the Olympic Village was built originally, New York Planet, and, and it was built about the last time we invested properly in affordable housing. It's a really nice place to live. And then everything changed, and now we have... And I, I recommend this to you. If you want to see... The worst example, go and look at the United Student Building in the Olympic Park. Have you seen it? Fucking carbuncles. <laughs> if I'm being honest, right? I, I try to be honest now, I can, I can afford, yeah. Uh, the design, when it was originally done, 50% affordable, 50% housing associated, to make the place work and then build it in a place that people will want to live. But now we're talking about building more, increasing the density, and potentially losing the benefit of the design. That is wrong. You have to start thinking about how do you make it work so that people will want to say that. It's got to be people at heart. We had the concept in Newham of resilience. We can't do things for people, but we can help them do it for themselves. People must be what's important. We had the biggest jobs brokerage in the country, transform our employment. We had uh, we, we, we are the only council that gives loans to people and gets them away from bloody Wonga and the rest of these people. We have the private sector licensing scheme. Half the prosecutions of criminal landlords in this country were done by Neum. On the basis that the, you want really bad design, go and look at what some of the private sector landlords are doing. People living in walk-in fridges. A guy living under the stairs with less room than Harry Potter had. People living cockroaches in homes that used to be owned by us. They were ours. They were social rent. And then we get people moving in, there was about a dozen people in the, in the building, a kid living in one room, that's the sort of stuff, sorry, I, I get very cross with the private sector license, I think. We have to, and then, then we bought 1,800 properties, mostly street properties, to try and get people, homeless families, places to live. We can be imaginative, but if we are imaginative just by building units and slinging things up and slinging up stuff that no bugger wants to live in, we'll be in the same place we are at the moment in lots of places, which is knocking them down. And it isn't just New York that's doing it. It's right parts of London, and outside London you can see that happening. So... I'd argue that it's got to be absolutely safe. I think it comes from the values. When we went to Canning Town, now here's the challenge though. We went to Canning Town. Canning Town used to be, we used to have nine areas in Newham. And you could choose, you had to choose seven. This was way back before Trust Based Lettings. Nobody chose Canning Town. I guess that told us something, do you think? That told us that. So we said, right, let's knock it down. But the people, of course, that were there, that was a really hard call. They did not like that. You're going to knock down a whole bunch of properties with people living in them. You can be as generous as you like, and we had the most generous scheme you could imagine, but it's going to be difficult. Now, the people round about, they get it if you, can, if you can show them the nature of what you're building. But how do you overcome the girl that spoke to me in Cumberland School when I was telling her what we're going to do? And she said, yeah, they're lovely properties you're going to build, but they're not for the likes of me. And it's how you connect, connect and communicate with the community on that. And that's really difficult. Trying to explain to people. First of all, people have it, have, find it difficult to imagine what a place will be like. And secondly, I'll challenge any of you locally. You, can, you, you, talk, you talk with the community. How many people do you get in when you talk to them? How many, many people really engage? How many people understand or make the effort to understand how do you do that is a challenge, but it's worth the effort and worth doing. We put lots of effort into our community neighbourhoods to try to get places that people would begin to engage in some of these issues. But I think it's a big and a challenging issue. So I guess what I want to say, because I can see Jack's doing his pen and going, yeah, it's time to finish, Robin. You don't want me to finish, do you? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I remember growing up in a place called On Thank, which is the worst estate in Scotland now. But it wasn't when I grew up. It was a council estate, properly built, decent homes, 
Not something you say was brilliant, but designed for what people wanted. And people were proud to live there. People went to work and created fa families and created lives there. You need to create a place that people are proud and proud to live in. A place that people enjoy living in. That's part, I think, of resilience. It's part about saying, we value you so much that we think you're entitled to a decent home and a home that is beautiful or well-designed, a home that is worth living in and not some bloody slum that we've slung up and now we can't keep people in. I think that's the challenge for us. So on this particular issue, and I say I'll leave the other issues about how you build and, 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 and solve the houses. On this particular <coughs> issue, if you sacrifice design, you will sacrifice you will sacrifice people. And by the way, it's more expensive. Because if you build, I live in a house that was built in 1870. We're knocking down houses that built in the 1950s and 60s. What do you think was the cheapest option in the long term for that? Um, before we go to the audience for a QA, I'd like to put Sarah's question to Helen and to Dawn. Right, is there a trade off between design and affordable housing? Should we, as Sir Robin said, should we sacrifice a few? Uh, for long-term beautiful communities that the community likes and wants. Uh, Dawn or Helen? Uh, so, so I think at, at, the, at the most basic level of design, good design as good functionality, that trade-off just doesn't exist. It doesn't, it doesn't cost more uh, to in, invest in well-laid-out new developments which have um, open space which have good ventilation in the properties, which have good quality insulation, which can perform well thermally over time. You know, that simply doesn't cost more. So that is a line that you know developers will bring to the table in a planning negotiation. But it's about our, you know, how well equipped our local authorities are to properly understand what really makes the difference in the long term. And you know, you fa fancy finishings are one thing. But having robust, simple materials that will stand the test of time in a building that is properly insulated and will cost its um, inhabitants less money to heat on a, a kind of winter by winter basis is, you know, is, is far more important. And those things needn't cost more if, if, you know, um, if we know what we're doing. Um, yeah, I completely agree. I think that we can build very, very good houses and we don't have to compromise on costs. I think it's a complete developer's line that's been, that you know, we have kind of bought into because not many local authorities are able to build as much now. Um, but good quality housing with good design lasts the test of time. We're not knocking it down constantly. We don't have to spend millions as we did you know, recently re refurbishing a lot of homes and you know, re-insulating them all the time. If, they're, if, in, if you start well, put the money in at the beginning and then also I think we need to look more at, instead of just the cost of how to build the housing right now look at the savings you make in healthcare in education because children have better better uh, learning outcomes if they're in stable homes and look at how much you can save by making people's lives better by giving them a stable home with a lot of space okay so uh, does anyone have a question um, so, uh, okay, so if we go to the gentleman, uh, then the blue, uh, and then the grey, and then um, the woman in the glasses, then we will do another round, don't worry. Uh, so please, precise with a question mark at the end. Please. Okay, hi, um, Tom Dewey from Hackney South and Shoreditch. Um, I sort of wanted to pick up on something that Robin said at the end of his uh, speech about how do you actually get people involved in the process, and it's, and the nature of the planning process is extremely confrontational, it's very negative, it's all about objecting, uh, and it generally involves a tiny, tiny proportion of local residents shouting about change and how they dislike change. How do you make that process and how is Labour going to use changes to planning policy to actually incentivise a better conversation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good question. Thank you. Um, my name's Elliot. I'm from a little town called Penarth in South Wales. Um, I'm a minor authority councillor and I'm also a builder. Um, I see cases come to us where we approve it, where you'd have a, a really nicely designed landmark building that get then rejected higher up because there's no boldness from planners um, on accepting something that is, there's a bit of thought in the design. Um, and that that building would be a landmark building. Also, that, that I see it when I drive around seeing clients that 
so many places over the last sort of 30, 20, 30, 40 years have been built with no regard to design and that if you've got an environment that is thought of and that is, there's design and quality put into it, that it has an effect on people's outlook on life, it has an effect on their, on their life in general. There's a, there's a place, just quickly, there's a place in Wiltshire called West Lees, um, just off the M4. Um, it's new. Every building is different, so they're not all the same box next to each other. Every single building next to each other is a different design. So you've got a Victorian Bayfront terrace, you've got a Georgian terrace, you've got a Dutch-style barn, no materials are repeated, and it's laid out on an organic grid. Um, it's, it, it's an inspiring place to live. More places should be built like that. that Did you have a question? No, it was just a comment <laughs> on... <laughs> I'm Jacqueline Pashu. I'm from Lewisham. I'm a councillor there. Uh, the, the, the thing that I, I sort of want to remind people of is design of building is only as good as the way that people are made to live in those buildings. Um, when you're talking about these places that are a step on the ladder, if you can't get the next step on the ladder, you're living there with children in what are very nice designed flats for dinkies, but not a designed flat for people living in. And, and, thinking, and where I represent as a councillor, uh, which is um, Bellingham, which was designed as a garden suburb, houses that were designed as family homes, three bedroom family homes, are being turned into HMOs mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. five or six people. And, and, and that doesn't work. And I think we've got to be very careful in the current climate uh, how we expect people to live in uh, buildings. Because, as I say, if you're talking about things that people are supposed to move out of or people that, uh, buildings that people are supposed to live in in a particular way, because where I was brought up on the edge of what was then called the Packington Estate in Islington, Georgian houses were pulled down because they were housing three and four families. Now, they would have been lovely to live in for one or two families, but they were pulled down and flats built on the site because they had become slums. And I feel that what we're building now will become slums if we don't think how people are having to live in them. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, we're going from left to right. Uh, so, how to get more people involved in the planning process? Yeah, I'll answer the one question we had. Um, I think that we, we have a big problem at the moment with the planning process, which is that often, um, either, by, either because councils are pressed or because they just don't want to do it, they really, they really don't work hard to involve people in any planning, uh, any planning procedures, and especially when it happens to their buildings. So, my um, the estate that I live on. I came home the other day, and we had a Lambeth-headed uh, sheet of paper shoved through my door, and it said we're going to do this thing. And it had one line where it said they were going to do something to the road. I couldn't really make out what that meant. And then it had a little two tick boxes where I said I agreed or I disagreed. And me and my two flatmates had to decide on that one piece of paper, find an envelope and a stamp, and post it back to Lambeth. And that was that was that was that was their entire engagement with us over what was going to happen to the area that we live in, and that makes absolutely no sense. Um, it, you know, I'm the kind of person that might do it. They're not going to get many people doing it at all, and it instantly made me feel as if they literally didn't care. It was a t it, it was a tick box that exercised both for me and for them, and you know, we they, you really need to, to go out and look at who is living in the local area. So often, um, especially when you're looking at refurbishing tower blocks. Um, one of the big issues with Grenfell Tower when they were refurbishing it was that every time they sent people round to ask them their opinions, they did it entirely in English. They didn't look at uh, the languages that people spoke in the tower. They didn't look at what time they were at home. They didn't give them any opportunity to do anything apart from come to one or two meetings that were at inconvenient times, speak verbally, and then go away. So you need to look at how people work. You need to look at who lives in the local area and look at multiple different ways of getting people's feedback and not just say, here is the option, do you want it or not? But say, here are a couple of options, and if you don't want any of them, what do you want, and how could we switch these around and actually make these work for you? You can't just say, this is what's going to happen, or not. You have to look at other ways that you, you could move it so that people will be happy with it then. Hello. 
Thanks. I, I mean, I, I, I agree with a, a lot of that. I think we, we have a plan, but it's a fundamental issue with our planning system. We have a planning system which um, overwhelmingly gives weight to the voices of people who are already well-housed homeowners. I mean, it, it, because everybody else in a community is, is not so invested for the long term, you know, but also um, has often got much more going on in their lives to take notice of that little piece of paper that comes through your door that tells you there's a planning application down the road. So we've got to find a way, and I think it has to be part of Labour's vision for planning, which is a fundamentally progressive discipline, which is about the redistribution of land resource to ensure that the needs of um, the collective needs of communities are balanced against the individual needs of, of, of private landowners. That's what our planning system is there for. Our labour vision of planning has to be um, formulated on an assumption that we give voice to those who stand and need to benefit from what new development can deliver, as well as those people who are settled in a community, and of course who have opinions and whose opinions are important, but whose need is perhaps not so pressing. So that's really, how we think through that is really important, but it's absolutely kind of on, on the button of where we need to be. Um, on the question about landmark buildings, so I really, really dislike the term landmark buildings because one person's landmark is another person's carbuncle. And you know, if we, if we, if we think about planning like that, that's all we're going to get is, you know, I really love it, I really hate it, I really love it, I really hate it. But the important thing is the, fr is, is the framework. If a community, if a properly resourced community planning process decides that across a large area, this is where we want ordinary terraced housing, but this is where we want something really special for our community that we can be proud of and, val and value, then, you know, that, that's the basis on which land planning decisions about landmark buildings should be, should be taking place. But it shouldn't be for the kind of emperor's new clothes approach to development to come along and say, look at this really flashy thing that we want to do. You know, of course, you know, surely planning authority you will say yes to this really flashy thing that we want to do. It has to come out of a values-based process about what's the right thing to do to do in this area. Um, and just on, on Jacqueline's point, that you're absolutely right about designing for flexible future use. And this government have stripped out... Um, when they first introduced the MPPF, they stripped out so many of the regulations about space standards, about um, mm -hmm. flexible design for the future, about lifetime homes came out of there, zero carbon homes came out of there, you know, all of these things that are about the longevity of buildings in communities and how they're used in the future. And again, that needs to be part of our fundamental rethink of the planning process as the, as the, as the Labour Party and, and restoring those values that, that buildings are for people um, at the heart of it. So, uh, I, I think um, Helen and, and Donna have answered some of the, the, the first point. I'll just make the aside that I, I think we talk a good game about getting the community involved. I think it's extremely difficult. I think people are often not interested unless it's actually affecting them, and we should be honest about that and say, how do we do that? What help could we get from either London government, uh, with a decent administration now, or, or God help us, maybe from national government, you go this lot, uh, to help us, how do we communicate? I will tell you that if you do move people out of their homes, you can have three meetings uh, on three, set, three evenings in a row with 150 people screaming at you, telling you that you're all sorts of bad people, um, which I had the pleasure of doing in Canning Town. And I understood why, because people were being asked to move out of homes they'd lived in, and they, it was their place, their home, and we were saying, do it so we can get something better. Now, to be fair, people see it, they like it, and now it's, it's kind of easier, and, and people round about can see it. But it's extremely difficult, and you're asking either people to lose their homes, which is a horrible thing, or you're asking people to engage in things that maybe they don't quite, you know, they're not that interested in. It's, so it's a really difficult challenge, but, but trying to get. Uh, there's 340,000 people in Newham. If you get 20 people to a meeting, does that constitute a meeting with the community? Of course it doesn't. How do you do it? We believe in surveys. Lots of surveys, try and talk to people, try and engage. But it's really, it's really difficult, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't minimise that difficulty. Uh, but we should try it. I think, going on to the question of the nature of the buildings of building, I, I, Everything comes round. When I first got on Newham Council, there was a young married couple scheme, which the Freemasons had introduced. And uh, young married couples would go into these properties and you couldn't have kids. Guess what happened? <laughs> Do you want to guess what happened? <laughs> Go on. Uh, on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, that's, you need move on. You need opportunities for people to move. And that requires us to think differently about how we do these things. For me, I, I just think you can, the Tories can shout about austerity all the like, well, what sort of mad 
place is it that doesn't invest in housing and says, I'll invest in housing because I'm going to get a rent back later, so what the hell do I care? It's not going to affect our debt because we'll get the money back. Why in any rational rational world would you not say I'm going to build housing? I'm just going to build housing. I'm going to fund it and build it. It's what I said earlier about we could take the profit and that then means build the right nature of housing in the right place. Stratford, fantastic place, great place. If you want to move anywhere, great place to move to. Uh, not as good as Forest Gate, but very nice. That's a place where younger people will tend to move to. We get that. Then there are homes that people need for, for families. How do we do that? I don't think we're talking enough about how we've let down the generations that have come afterwards. And it's a scandal and a disgrace that we have not got an answer and we are not saying that's the big issue for us. How do we help people move? I, when I was a student, I lived in a place with rats and all sorts of stuff, but I knew it was going to get better. So long as you know it's going to get better and you can see a way forward, then you have an opportunity. But that's why we need to think about the types and nature of property we're building and we need to think about well, let's just build the damn things. Let's just borrow the money and build it. I, I struggle to understand why we wouldn't do it. As I said to you earlier, Bexley are doing it. How shameful is that? Uh, we're going to the audience for another round of questions. Um, so, if... Oh, gosh, I have to choose. Um, so, we go to the gentleman in the pink shirt here, and then the gentleman in the blue at the back, and then the guy in the T-shirt right at the back as well. Thank you. Hi, uh, Pete Andrew, Home Builders Federation. Um, I've heard a lot of good stuff today, and uh, I'm particularly, um, I'm, I, I particularly support community planning. To be quite frank, I think community planning works really well. Uh, it doesn't work in every occasion, and you need to get beyond the bit about not in my backyard, and that's sometimes really quite difficult. As you're saying, Robin, but. Uh, for me, it's about placemaking. It's about creating places where people live rather than individual buildings, however they look, and they've all got to work together. So my question for you guys is design and placemaking particularly is very subjective. So how do we get to a place where we can pull a decision onto the punch quickly, as quick as, quick as possible, rather than potentially milking a design away because... It gets interfered with, and there are there are um, there are methods of doing that. Building for Life 12 is one uh, design review, these kind of things. So, what's the best way to do that? So, actually, we get some good decisions rather than milked down decisions. Okay, and the gentleman in blue at the back. Hmm. Uh, so, on topic of, of building beautiful buildings, I think an issue that it's a bit left field of what you're going for, but. Uh, there are plenty of buildings that have already been built and built to good standards and good uh, infrastructure connections and things in, in cities like London. So where London has uh, more than half of buildings in Greater London are one or two storeys high. And you can compare that to cities like Paris, uh, where mid-rises are much more common, um, but people aren't able to, to build these sort of extensions, uh, which would just provide loads more housing without having to even get into the issue of how much uh, greenbelt land you want to expand on uh, or not, because the groundwork is already there. Um, to what extent do you think it's important to allow that sort of uh, small scale expansion of housing and what can be done about that? Okay. And then the gentleman in the t-shirt. Hi, Daniel Harris, uh, Cambridge CLP and structural engineer. Um, there was a small point made about how developers seem to be driving towards cutting back on materials in terms of um, like thermal lining of buildings and the rest of it. That's probably not just the developers. I also see it on contractors as well. And from what I understand, con the way the industry is set up and procured, contractors at this point in time, to actually make money, a lot of them only make profit by suing other parts of the business or mm. other clients. They're not actually making money on their day-to-day -day business. And that sort of goes in hand in mm. hand with how contracts are set up. The developer mm. or the client has a fixed fee, then they just don't want any risk or any responsibility at all. They palm it off on typically a design and build, and then every single party, designers, uh, local authorities and contractors, all fight each other over different margins and try and cut corners wherever possible simply to try and make a margin. Um, so my question, or my, what, I would wonder what the panel's thoughts are on changing the procurement of the industry and maybe getting the contractors involved at early stages along with the local community and developers. Okay, 
three great questions, and we'll go left to right again, please. So, <laughs> um, I think we're really short on time, so I'll be as quick as possible. I'll just answer the last one. Um, I think we need to look... I think we need the government to actually... And I don't think they will, but we need the government to actually look at the materials we use and the safety and make people feel a lot happier. A, about the stuff that we see popping up around the cities that we live in. Often we see the underside of buildings before it goes up. We know it looks sh it looks shoddy. We know that you know it's not great quality. But also people are very worried post Grenfell about all of the materials that have been used. And I think that you know I completely agree with you. There's a big problem with contractors. But I think there's also you know as you said the big problem is procurement. We have these massive uh, supply chains that are really really impenetrable. And I think we need more transparency there. Um, and we need a lot more guidance on what materials we can use. And we need building regulation to be much much stricter than they are. That's not what, what's holding you know building back. It's the fact that people want to make as much profit as possible. Helen, do you want to choose one of the questions? Um, yeah, so I'm gonna, I'll, I'll pick um, the uh, well um, the question about design being subjective. So, so I think some aspects of design are subjective. Quite a lot of it isn't actually. And if you if you enshrine things like good space standards, good open space standards, good you know I remember a plan, my the very very first local planning committee that I sat on when I was, when I was a council and we took a decision about some uh, an affordable housing scheme and I managed to get in a little condition about the depth of the window reveals because I knew it would make the scheme look better for longer um, in, in the area. You know, things like that can be put into policy and then they're not subjective, they're just part of the requirement. So that's important. And then I think getting community buy-in at the early stages. So, you know, so it's all about the plan. And if this is our shared plan as a community and then the planning applications are coming into it as individual pieces of the jigsaw, that's a far less contested way to go about it than this sort of predatory, you know, I've got a bit of land and I'm going to try and maximise the value that I can get out of it type of approach, which is what we see far too often. So I think neighbourhood planning, community planning and, and engagement, but also having, uh, you know, the government completely stripped out so much detail from planning policy and guidance at the national level. And I think there's scope for a bit more of that coming sort of top down so that the parameters are clear and then everyone can get on with the job of delivering rather than arguing about whether they have to deliver or not and, and if so, if so on, what, on what terms. Um, and on the up, not out point, um, which is, um, is actually a policy that lots of my Tory colleagues are very um, keen on because they think that it means that we don't ever have to build on any other land at all. And that, I, I mean, I just think that isn't... That isn't true, um, but I do think there's a role for it, and I think um, you know understanding where where that might be appropriate and, and giving guidance to councils to, to be able to do that process if they want to is um, yeah, yeah. A good thing. Uh, Sir Robin, very quickly, I, I am like many of you passionate remainer, but I wouldn't mind dumping Oju procurement is bust in this country, and we really need to think of because we spend so much money doing procurement that it comes, out of the, it comes out of the thing in the end. So the whole procurement thing needs to be rethought and re-looked at. So I am a Remainer minus Oju, which I, I think is a, a reasonable and sensible position. <laughs> I'll settle for, uh, I'll settle for a, a, a ballot. Um, in terms of um, the, 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 the issue about building, I, actually, interestingly, policy exchange are looking, I understand, at the issue of company housing for that, using some of the bits of land or the buildings and development buildings. Anything that will add to supply is a good thing. If you've got places that you can, providing it's done with the community in mind, taking, taking big office blocks and converting them into, to house, into cheap housing is not necessarily the right answer. But doing something sensible to develop, I, I know it's something that Red Door Venture, our, our, our company, our housing company in Newham did, they, they, they took some property and redid them. So it's, it's entirely right if it's done, done properly. And, and finally, and, you know, I have to say, I, I would change the whole process. See, I, I, I keep getting to, kept getting into these arguments with developers. Oh, what, what are you going to do? I say, look, never mind 106, never mind sell. You go ahead and build, and build something nice and beautiful, and I'll have 20% of what you build. Or I'll have 20% of your rents when you rent them. I'll have it afterwards. We did once say to somebody, um, they said that the homes are going to be worth this, and we said, oh, well, we'll buy them at that then. We'll buy them all off you, and suddenly they got more valuable. It, it is a system that we, we, we front load it instead of saying, if you're a developer doing something, let's have a really high quality development, let's see what you're doing, and we'll take our tax cut out later on, especially as lots of people are building to rent. In my view, B, you'd say, well, I'll have 5% or 10% of your revenue, fantastic, and I'll use that for housing. And I'll hypothecate that into housing. I think we need to rethink how we do these things. While we are in a position where we battle with them, um, developers who want to make money, come on, of course they do, um, 
while we're in that position, it incentivizes them to lie, it incentivizes them to cut corners, it incentivizes them, and I think Helen made a very good point about, you know, once you've got the basic, basic shape, they can do all sorts of things to change it. So, actually, no, build it and we'll have it afterwards. We'll see how much it's really worth. And then we'll have it. And I just think we need to think differently about how we approach that. But hey, that's just me because I've got fed up uh, with the argument with developers all the time. God, these poor people, you know, they've no money. It's hard for developers to make a few bob, you know. I think on that note, we will close this in. Um, yes, thank you. Um, thank you all for coming. It's astonishing that people stay for an hour to listen to planning policy. <laughs> <laughs> it was the wrong way.